everyone. So today on Dark Skies, I want to give you like an introduction to night sky photography. This is like Milky Way Photography 101. So what I'm going to be talking about today are like the basic gear setup you'll need. So the basic just building blocks for night sky photography from a camera perspective. As well after that, I'm going to talk to you guys about the planning. Because planning night sky photography is actually, you know, one of the bigger challenges. You know, not a lot of us can actually go, just go outside of our door and snap a few shots of the night sky. We actually have to plan our trips, drive quite a distance to get to these dark side locations and capture these photos. So I'm going to talk to you guys about what you'll need to know before you even leave the house and whether it's worth leaving the house to take some of these photos. Lastly, I'm going to talk to you guys about, you know, what you need to do when you're actually in the field. So, you know, what camera settings you're going to need based on the gear you have as well as how to photo, you know, focus your camera at night and so on. So there's a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is hardware. So this is my setup right, right here, um, and I wanna start from the bottom and the top and just kinda of talk about each one of these parts independently. So what you're going to start with is a base, a solid base, a solid tripod, because we're going to be doing long exposure photos. So we can't hold our camera in our hand and hold it still for, you know, say 30 seconds or 15 seconds and get a really sharp image. We need to have our camera on a tripod. So get a tripod that's, you know, sturdy enough. It doesn't need to be like 500 pounds or anything. It just needs to be sturdy enough that if there's a little breeze like there is right now, that it's not going to move around and shake because any kind of shake like this will cause all sorts of like wobbles in your image just the pinpoint stars will start to look streaky and you know and basically ruin your photo so you know start with a really you know solid tripod and which brings me to the camera strap actually you know because there's a breeze blowing here make sure you take the camera strap off your camera i have these nice quick release camera um camera strap that i can just pop it off like this um, because if your camera strap is on your camera um, it can also, you know, cause some wobble um, and extra pull on your tripod um, if the wind starts to blow or something like that. So make sure your camera strap is off. If you have a sturdy tripod, um, that's basically the starting point. On top of that, I have a ball head and this just gives me versatility to move around and add all sorts of like different degrees of movement to my photograph. There are lots of different ball heads. You don't need a um, just tripod heads rather you don't need a ball head um, but you know just use basically whatever comes with your tripod uh, but if you have a choice I love ball heads myself so on top of that we have the camera body and the camera lens so for night sky photography you obviously need a camera that has uh, you know enough sophistication that it has like a manual mode um, and you know the ability to have interchangeable lenses is great um, so I have a DSLR camera here. This is a full frame DSLR camera. And the reason I love full frame, it just gives you that full perspective, the full uh, wide perspective at 35 millimeter. There are these other cameras called crop sensor cameras and micro four thirds cameras. Um, but those sensors are a lot smaller. And what they actually do is they crop the frame uh, and which the result is that it makes it look like it's zoomed in a bit more. If you use this like in a 24 millimeter lens on each one of those cameras. So if I want to get the maximum like wide angle um, with my camera, I look to full frame camera bodies. You know, you really, you don't need a full frame camera, um, camera body, but if you do have um, access to one or if you do own one already, uh, it's, it's a, you're in a great position. But if you have a crop sensor, that's fine too. You're just gonna need a wider lens, like a 14 millimeter lens to shoot with um, to just get that really full expanse of the night sky. Uh, and one of the things you keep keep in mind is with the night sky is that the wider lens you have, the longer exposure you can you can take. And this is simply because you know the Earth's turning, and um, you know if you have a really really long exposure, those stars will start to streak in your night sky. But the wider your lens, the more forgiving those uh, those streaks become because the star points become smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you have a super wide angle lens, you can go longer because those streaks are going to be ever, ever so small. So with a crop sensor camera, you're already going to be zoomed in. So you need to kind of compensate that zoom with a really much wider lens. Or you have a full frame camera body and you have a super wide angle lens like this 24 millimeter or a 14 millimeter and you just get an absolutely um, you know, full encompassing um, view of the night sky. So that's essentially it. You need a tripod, you need a ball head, you need a camera, 
you need a camera lens, uh, and you're off to the races. You know, that's the basic setup. So inside of the camera body, you're gonna need a really wide angle lens and you're gonna need a fast wide angle lens. What I mean by fast is that it has a really um, wide aperture. So this camera lens is a 24 millimeter F1.4. And what that means is that the aperture, the hole where the light goes in, can get really big because the, the starlight is actually is super, super dim and it's super, super faint. So you need as much light to get into your camera sensor as you possibly can. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is you need to get yourself into a really dark location. If you live in a city and you go outside at night, if you look up, you're not gonna see many stars. You might see a couple here and there. You might, you know, depending on where you live, you might see quite a few. But for the most of us, uh, we're gonna have to drive really, really far to get to one of these dark sky locations. Uh, and there is a great tool to allow us to kind of find out where these dark sky locations are and it's called a light pollution map and you can bring that up and inside of that you'll be able to scan the maps just like you would like Google Maps or something like that but there's this layer on top of it and it's actually the light that the, that's being emitted from these cities and so when you look at the map you know, the really bright areas are like urban centers like this one here is uh, Toronto for example uh, but if you pan around you'll be able to find like yellow areas or green areas or blue areas and black areas and the black areas are the absolute best. The blue areas are amazing. Green areas are awesome. That's where I am today. I'm in a green area. Uh, even yellow areas are, are, are doable. You can get an okay shot of the stars, especially if you're gonna shoot straight into the night sky. So once you have your dark sky location picked out, you need to think about the moon phase. The moon is like a bright light in the night sky, and it's gonna drown out that starlight just like city lights would. So I will usually check the, the moon phase calendar for the month, and I'll look at the new moon. And the new moon is when there's absolutely no moon up at all at night. And that's like the most ideal time to shoot the night sky. But it doesn't always line up that you can be out, uh, out at night during the new moon. So what I'll usually do is I'll look for you know, five to seven days on either side of the new moon. And within that window, I'll have a chance to shoot the night sky at some point throughout the night, whether it's early in the morning or whether it's after sundown. Um, so today it's actually the new moon so I'll have all night to shoot tonight which is super awesome. It doesn't always happen this way that you get clear weather on the new moon but I got lucky today. The weather is such a wild card. You know it, it's, it's probably the most unpredictable part of all the factors that you have to think about when shooting the night sky. So what I usually do you know before any trip I'm going to take is look at the five day weather forecast and I'll get a sense of what the weather is going to be like coming up. And if it's looking like it, it, it's gonna you know, work out and there'll be a clear sky in the, next, in the time that I'm away, then that's great. But before I actually head out you know, on my trip, I'll look at the, it's called an astronomical forecast at cleardarksky.com. And that'll give me like cloud cover forecast for the uh, about 48 hours to 24 hours um, before I wanted to get out and shoot. And that'll give me just that you know, next level of confidence that I know if I'm gonna drive, you know, two plus hours to a dark sky location, that when I get there, it's actually gonna have, you know, be clear and I'll be able to shoot the stars. This is a great app I wanted to show you called Astrospheric. And this will allow you to do um, the weather forecast, the moon phase and the light pollution map all within one app, which is just phenomenal because before that you had to check all sorts of different websites um, and all sorts of things like that. And Astrospheric actually brings in the information from cleardarksky.com that I talked about previously. So I load this up. What this will do is still give me basically a map of where I am in the world. On top of that, it'll give me a, the, the next, the past 48, or sorry, the next 48 hours of time. And in there, it'll also give me um, the cloud cover. So this top row here is the cloud cover. Oh, I've got a mosquito on me. Um, and dark blue is actually super clear and white is cloudy. So I can actually move through time here and get a sense of what the cloud cover is going to be like in my area. And this, this will actually give me the confidence to know, um, like I mentioned earlier, that it's going to be super clear uh, at the location that I want to go to. On top of that, if I move down here, there's a, there's a yellow line and there's a white line. And the yellow line is when the sun's gonna set and the, the, the white line is when the moon is gonna set. 
So this will tell me that at, you know, 1938 or 738 that the moon is going to set. And at 2056 or 856, the sun is going to set. And I know I'm going to be able to shoot all through the night with both the sun and the moon set. Um, so n that's not, the moon is not going to play a factor um, with me shooting tonight, which is absolutely fantastic. And this is all done in one app. And if I want to see, um, you know, if my map, you know, if my location, um, you know, is in a really dark spot, I can load up the map by just tapping on it. And I can click on this light bulb here. And what this light bulb will do is it'll give me an overlay of the light pollution. And I can zoom in and I can check the light pollution exactly where I am. Um, so to do all of these things in one app um, is absolutely phenomenal. So I'd highly recommend checking out Astrospheric. It's just an absolutely essential app for night sky photographers. Okay, so once you have a dark sky location picked out, you, you know, you've checked the weather, it's, it's looking like it's gonna be awesome. Um, you, and the moon is not gonna be a play a factor in your, in your images. You know you're gonna have an opportunity to actually see the stars and, and photograph the stars, which is, which is amazing. That doesn't happen all that often. That confluence of dark sky location, weather and moon, it, it only happens like a few days every month that you can actually get out and photograph the stars, which is what makes it such a really cool experience. Um, but once you're actually there, um, you know, the time of the year actually will play a factor in what, what you will see when you're out there shooting the night sky. And most photographers really want to capture that core of the Milky Way, that big bright center spot uh, and the band of light that comes with it. At least here in the Northern Hemisphere, um, that's what people were looking for. And, you know, as the Earth goes around the Sun, our perspective of the Milky Way will change um, based on you know the day and the night and where that Milky Way is in orientation with the Earth. So earlier in the spring, for example, that Milky Way core is going to be rising you know just before uh, sunrise. But as we move around the Earth and the, you know we move into summer, um, that Milky Way is going to be rising um, earlier and earlier in the morning to the point where it, we get to where we are now, which is the July, and when the sun goes down, that Milky Way is going to be right above us here in the night sky. It'll be right ready for us to take a photograph of, which makes, you know, June and July really like prime time for Milky Way photography here in the Northern Hemisphere. So just keep that in mind um, when, you're, when you're planning your night sky photography shoot. Um, just have a look uh, at, you know, Sky Guide or some sort of, you know, Stellarium app to see if the, the Milky Way will be where you want it to be in the night sky. Okay, so the sun's gone down now. I still have a few hours before the, the, the stars come out. Right now I'm just hanging out on my brother's farm. Um, that's why I have them around all these hay bales, which will make an awesome foreground element to the Milky Way shots I'm gonna do later. So um, right now I'm just gonna chill out and wait for the stars to come out. But if uh, you have you have access to uh, you know a family member or someone, you know, a friend that has a cottage, it's a really great opportunity to just, you know, Go to a place you feel more comfortable because being out at night can be pretty uncomfortable especially if you're not used to night sky photography uh, so you have access to one of these places where you can just go and you can bring your camera with you you can park close by um, it's it's a great opportunity just to, to learn the the fundamentals of night sky photography without you know being in a really you know freaky remote location um, it'll help you relax it'll help you just you know take better photos and you know you're not going to disturb anybody people aren't going to disturb you so if you have access to something like that I highly recommend it I remember the first time I shot uh, the night sky I just found some random baseball diamond in some small town and it didn't have a lot of light so I just went to the outfield and I just set my stuff up there and I was fumbling with my camera and uh, you know I learned an absolute ton in that space and then from there I just kind of branched out and went further in, into different locations from there so highly recommend getting yourself into a location where you you know your car is not super far away and you're feeling super comfortable um, and uh, yeah you can just kind of play and fumble with your camera so gonna wait for the stars to come out now I think there's some sort of weird like I'm not sure if you can hear that buzzing but this tree over here is like 500,000 June bugs or something it's kind of freaking me out but uh, anyways I'll be back here a bit later uh, and we'll talk to you guys then under the stars
Okay, so we're out here at night now, and the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is how to focus your camera at night. Now, it doesn't seem like the most straightforward thing because, you know, autofocus doesn't work at night. There's nothing to autofocus against. So, you have to put your camera into manual mode. And then from there, you have, there's a couple things you have to do to get the, the, the stars pinpoint sharp in the night sky. So for my camera here, what I first do is I'll turn my lens to infinity on the camera. And that will get my, my stars pretty sharp right away. From there, I'll turn my camera into live view mode. And there's a button on the back of the camera that puts it in live view mode. And then I can see on the screen. Now my screen has uh, a touch screen, so I can just uh, touch this magnifying glass here. And I can move this around the screen. There's a couple of really bright stars here. So I'm gonna focus in on this one. And I'll hit the magnifying glass. And then I'll hit it again. And this will give me 10 times zoom uh, on that star. And you can see in this, uh, this star, it's actually quite uh, at a focus, even though I put it on infinity. So if I move my focus ring back and forth and back and forth, I can find that perfect spot where that, that star gets as small as possible. And when it's as small as possible, then we know it's absolutely in focus. So I'm gonna move it back and forth and there. That looks great. So I know for sure at this point that my star is gonna be in perfect focus. So here I can turn uh, my zoom off and I can turn my live view off. And then from this point forward, I won't touch my lens. I'll just start, start taking photos of the night sky and they'll be in focus. And that's as, as simple as that. The next thing we wanna talk about is camera settings. So once you have your camera set up, your lens is focused, we'll need to take the shot. So there are three things we need to concern ourselves with. There's shutter speed, there's aperture, and there's ISO. So for night sky photography, um, we're gonna set our ISO really high at the beginning. So I would recommend trying 3200 out of the gates. And if your image looks really grainy, maybe bump that down to 1600. But if it doesn't look grainy at all, then maybe bump it up to 6400. A lot of modern cameras can shoot at really high ISOs these days and maintain a lot of detail. But for me, I always like to start at 3200 and go from there. The next thing is the aperture. Now this really depends on the lens that you're using. Now, what you wanna do though as a rule of thumb is set it to the fastest or most wide aperture as you possibly can get. You need this lens to be as wide open to absorb all that subtle, um, faint starlight. I'm gonna set this camera lens to f1.4 uh, and that's gonna allow all sorts of light in. I'm gonna be able to get so much detail. It's gonna be fantastic. F2.8 lenses are also amazing. F4 lenses are borderline. You know, you're gonna get some detail, but you're not gonna get a lot. After four, uh, it's getting pretty dicey. It's, you won't really see all that much. But So if you can get your hands on an F2.8 lens, that's great. If you can get your hands on an F1.4 lens, that's even better. So aperture is, the rule of thumb, is, is the widest setting as it'll go. The last thing is shutter speed, and this is probably the trickiest one with regards to night sky photography, because it really depends on the lens you're, shoot, you're shooting with and the camera body you're using. So I'm using a full frame camera and a 24 millimeter lens. And there's a rule called the 600 rule, which is basically just a formula where you'd enter in your camera body sensor size and the, the focal length of your camera. And it would spit out basically a shutter speed based on the, those parameters. So. I would highly recommend this app called Dark Skies, and it will basically allow you to enter in the camera that you're using, as well as the, the focal length of the, of the lens that you're using, and it'll just generate a um, shutter speed for you. And you'll be able to put that shutter speed into your camera, and then when you shoot the night sky, you know that it's gonna be as long as it can possibly get without seeing trails in the night sky. Because a lot of your night sky photos, you don't wanna see those trails unless you're specifically going for a star trails photo. Um, a lot of times you want those stars to be nice um, pinpoints. So um, check out the Dark Skies app um, and check out the 600 rule, um, depending on the camera um, body you have and the camera lens you're using. Okay, so now we have our camera all set up. It's focused, we know the settings we're gonna use for a night sky shot. What's left is just to hit the button and take the shot. 
But um, if we just go ahead and press this button and take the photo, by actually just by pressing this button here, we're going to introduce shake into the camera. And what that's going to do is it's going to introduce wobble in our stars and just kind of create a blurry image. And we really don't want that. We want a nice sharp uh, image. So how do we fix this? Um, almost every single camera you buy these days, wow, huge mosquito. <laughs> almost every single camera we buy these days um, has a two second timer. So in your camera settings, change your, you know, your, your shot to two second timer. Uh, and then what happens is when we hit the butter, uh, butter, <laughs> like I'm hungry, can you tell? When I hit the button, um, the camera's gonna count two seconds and then it'll take a shot. And this will allow the, you know, the shake to kind of calm down and uh, you'll have this, you know, nice sharp shot. Uh, another thing you can do is you can, if you can get a really super cheap, you know, these are available on Amazon just for super cheap, uh, is a remote button. Um, and you can plug it into the side or the front or wherever it goes on your camera. And what that does is that you can just basically hit the button from here and it'll, sh it'll throw the shutter on the camera without you having to touch it. And again, you'll get these really nice sharp uh, images. Okay, one final thing I wanted to share with you guys. Um, you know, you might be wondering yourself, what's the deal with the red lights? You know, you see a lot of night sky photographers use red lights. So when you come to a dark location like this, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for your eyes to really adjust to the dark. It, it takes that much time for your eyes to get into that dark mode. Um, so when you walk around with a really bright white light, it's gonna switch your eyes back into daylight mode and you're gonna lose that night vision. So if you're constantly flicking your white headlamp on, when you turn that off, you gotta wait that like 15, 20 minutes for your eyes again to adjust to the dark. But if you use a red light, you're not going to have that happen. You're going to preserve that night vision. And when you turn your headlamp off, um, you're going to see those stars like you would, you know, previously. So that's why people use red lights. An additional thing is that the red light's a bit more subtle. It's not so crazy bright. So if you're out at a location with a ton of other people or just a, one other person, um, you know, it's a bit more subtle using a, bit, a red light. It's, it's almost like, you know, a bit of respect for the other person who's out there that you know, you're not gonna be casting all sorts of light into their scene. Uh, if there isn't anyone around, then go to town. But if there, if there are other folks around, um, watch out where you're flashing that light because someone might be doing a time lapse or someone might be just taking their you know, shot of their life. You never know. Uh, so the last thing they want is to have this kind of crazy light you know, coming into their scene and just kind of busting it for them. So that's it. You, um, you know, we've gone through the basics of what gear you need. You've gotten yourself into a really dark location, and hopefully, it's super clear. Um, the moon's not blazing, you, <laughs> blazing out your photos. And uh, yeah, you know, you know what camera settings you need, and you know how to focus your camera at night. So all you need to do now is find that perfect composition and uh, hit that shutter button, and you'll get your photo. If you do want to have that extra layer in your photo, um, which is yourself, um, what you can do is you can put your camera on the 10 second timer instead of the 2 second timer and you can run into the photo, like get yourself into the scene and, and whether it be, you know, if you're with these hay bales or with your some other element, a tree or a lake, you know, and maybe bring your headlamp with you and you can kind of illuminate yourself in some sort of fashion and you can create your own kind of night sky selfie. Um, it's, it's always a fun thing to kind of get yourself in these shots and kind of show that, you know, relationship between, you know, humanity and, you know, the stars above. And I think I'm going to do a second part of this series, which would be just like intro to Milky Way processing, because, you know, once you get the shots on your camera, there's still, you know, some work that needs to be done when you get home on, you know, pulling out a lot of the detail that you saw and post-processing your images. So you, you know, you, you kind of bring them to life. So that'll be in part two. 
So if you love this video, it'd be really awesome if you subscribed and it'd be super, super awesome if you also like this because that means, you know, it'll really help get this video out to other folks who would find it helpful. So yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you guys in the next one. Cool. Take care.